So I'm going to give you a little bit of information about floating point numbers, uh, but don't worry too much because I'm not going to expect you to actually be able to convert back and forth between regular integers and floating point numbers. I just want to show you how they work. Um, in 301, you're going to spend a bit more time on floating point numbers and you can really understand um, what a fraction gets, how a fraction gets represented and why floating point numbers are a big deal and why you should use integers whenever you can. So, so far we've dealt with discrete, what we call discrete data. Uh, discrete data means that there's like a one and then a two and there's nothing in between, right? Rational numbers are discrete. There's individual numbers, but there's gaps between them. Um, a lot of what we do in higher level languages is in fact um, continuous, or we'd like it to be continuous, right? Now floating point numbers are not continuous, but you have uh, far more numbers between each number and you can, you can get sort of as specific as you want because you can use exponents now with floating point numbers. That's the main advantage, right? We talk about floating point numbers as being, you know, fractional numbers or numbers that are, you know, one point something, whatever. The main advantage is the exponents. And the, the, as you'll see, the, the fractions sort of come along for the ride. So we want to be able to represent numbers that are like a half or numbers that are like two to the 38 or stuff like, stuff like that. Numbers that are more than just integers. Uh, and that's the main motivation with floating point numbers. In C++, you're going to represent them as float or double. Um, and a lot of people will just use floating point numbers everywhere because they're more flexible than integers. But there are a lot of problems with floating point numbers, and you should not use them unless you need to, as we'll see. So here's how they work. Basically, the idea is if we have numbers that represent integers, uh, then we can also use the same kind of idea to represent fractions. Right? Integers are positive powers of 2. 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2, 2 to the 3, 2 to the 4, right? 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. But if we just go the other direction and use negative powers instead, 2 to the negative 1, 2 to the negative 2, 2 to the negative 3, these are uh, fractional powers of 2, and this gives you 1 over 2, 1 over 4, or a half, a quarter, an eighth. And again, this is just like base 10, right? You have 100, 10, 1, and then you have one tenth, one one hundredth, one one thousandth, etc. And the same is going to happen in binary. You have four and two and one, and then a half or 0.5, and then a quarter or 0.25, and an eighth, 0.125. And just like with base 10, if you have enough of these fractional powers, you can represent any number, right? And so this is the essence of a, of a fractional binary number. It's a number that's less than one, and it's represented by a negative power instead of a positive power. So if I were to give you 110.010, you would add two, uh, you'd, this is wrong, you'd add uh, four and two, there's no ones, but then there's no halves, then it's a quarter. So this should actually be um, not 3.25, but 6.25, there's an error here. So that's the first part, is to allow fractional binary numbers. Pretty straightforward. Um, but then the next thing we want to do is allow that point to not necessarily be to the uh, right of 1. We can allow that point to be some other place by using an exponent, right? We talk, we have this in, in base 10 all the time, right? 3.5 times 10 to the 6 or whatever. That means that that point isn't at 1, it's at 1,000 or whatever, 10,000. 10, 6, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, a million. So that point represents a different number based on the exponent. And we can do the same thing in base 2. We have 110.010, uh, uh, and again, this should be 6.25, times 2 to the something, right? What is this number? 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, that's 4. So this is 6.25. I'll make that clear. Whoops. Uh, this is 6.25 times 2 to the 4, which is in fact 52. And you can imagine uh, having a negative exponent here, which makes the numbers really small or really big. And that means you can make great big numbers and great small numbers and really specific numbers and really general numbers. And you can sort of have a wider variety of access to numbers that you might be useful for, you know, measuring the distance between stars or the distance between atoms or whatever. Uh, so this is going to be much more useful than just integers between 0 and 4 billion or between negative 2 billion and positive 2 billion if you're talking about signed numbers. And just like with, with regular integers, it would be nice to be able to have positive and negative 
values and positive and negative exponents. So you can already see how this is starting to get really complicated, right? You're going to have a sign for the value. You're going to have a sign for the exponent. You're going to have to store the exponent, how much is uh, like where the decimal point is, the value of that exponent of two. And you're going to have to store the value itself. So there's four different pieces of information. Um, there are a couple of tricks we can use, but in general, uh, we don't have the same kind of elegance that we would with two's complement. We basically just put a whole bunch of value there and rely on the computer to sort it out. And this is why floating point numbers are so much more time consuming and energy consuming and resource consuming than regular integers is because we don't have any magic tricks. We just say it's going to be a negative number. So we put a bit to represent the fact that it's negative or positive. And then we put a bunch of bits to represent the significant or the mantis of the floating point part. And then we put a bunch of bits to represent the exponent and its, uh, its sign as well. And then we just rely on the computer to take all those pieces. And if we wanted to add two numbers together, we have to move the pointer. It's super complicated. So um, anyway, it's a lot of work and it's worth avoiding uh, if you can. Now, sometimes you can't. Sometimes you have to use floating point numbers. And I'm not saying don't use them. I'm just saying recognize that in terms of the uh, amount of time that your computer has to spend doing things, floating point numbers are on the order of 10 times more work for a computer to add them together or multiply them or whatever. So be aware of that constraint. Um, exponents are going to be negative and positive, uh, but because they're going to be embedded in this representation, uh, we can't really use the two's complement tricks that we had before. Right? And also that because the exponent means that the place values are going to change, right? when you have an exponent, it means that the place values that, that you see don't actually represent the place values that you say they are. Each one of them is going to be shifted by the exponent. And so you can't just say this place value is negative because the exponent might shift it around. So we can't use those two's complement tricks. We can't use them to store the exponent because it's embedded in the representation. We can't use them to store the whole number because the place values may change. It's just, we're just gonna have to be, just do the work. <laughs> uh, so we're gonna do, there's there's a standard format called IEEE um, 754, I think it is, uh, that most computers use these days. And that's the example that we're gonna use here. Again, I don't expect you to know it in detail, uh, but I expect you to know the concerns and the constraints of it. Uh, so the exponent is stored using a signed format called biased. Uh, this is different than a signed format of two's complement. Basically what it does, it takes the numbers zero to the biggest number and shifts them so that the middle number is zero instead of the last number. There's some advantages. It means you can shift them in whatever way you want and you can have lots of really big exponents, lots of really small exponents, but it means that some of the tricks with two's complement just don't work. We're going to store the significant in a format called normalized. We're going to regularize the value so that it's one point something times two to the something. And if every number is one point something, we don't have to store that one. And so we throw it away. That's called normalization. And again, all these little fiddly details, don't worry too much. I'm going to post another optional video that will walk through the details in a lot of detail so that you can know it if you want to know it. But I'm not going to test it on the exam. It's not, it's not, there's, there's already plenty of stuff in the course. <clears throat> there are specialized encodings for zero uh, because now we have lots of different zeros. We have a positive zero and a negative zero and zeros with different exponents. So we're going to have a special encoding where all the bits are zero and we're going to say that is zero. And if we have one and all the bits are zeros, that's negative zero. So we have to have special logic to compare positive zero and negative zero, right? Just like we talked about with the sign magnitude representation, it kind of sucks. But this is how two's complement has to be done. There aren't any magic formulas. It, there's no other options. It has to be done this way. Uh, we have special encodings for infinity and not a number. Uh, this is how in your calculator and your computer, you can get answers that are either NAN or infinity. These come from the floating point specialized representations. And again, check the optional video if you want details on that. Uh, there's a single precision that's 32 bits and a double precision that is 64 bits. You do not need to know these encoding formats for the exam. Uh, but you do need to know how MIPS does floating points. So we'll walk through all of that in the next video.